this year and voters. It's very because I will bring you back a balanced budget. This year, like voters will see. decide who will lead the city of Jonesboro. Tonight, the three men vying to replace Mayor Harold Perrin will make their pitch. Good evening, and thank you for joining us as we broadcast tonight the Jonesboro mayoral debate live from the studios of Arkansas State it's University of School of so Media and Journalism. Back. Mayor Harold Perrin's time like in office see. ends this year. He is not seeking re-election, citing a health issue. Perrin was elected in 2008 and for 12 years led Jonesboro through massive growth. Downtown storefronts saw new retail and restaurants. The old fairgrounds on Red Wolf developed with places to eat and shop. And most recently, Perrin led the city through the aftermath of a tornado. And now, voters will select a person to lead the city. And let's introduce you to these men. First, we have local businessman Thomas Elwood. He owns a family tree service in Jonesboro, Thomas Elwood. We have next, Andy Shatley is the director of sports medicine at St. Bernard's Hospital, Andy Shatley. And finally, Harold Copenhaver is the senior business development officer for Centennial Bank. He's a former state representative, Harold Copenhaver. We begin tonight's discussion with opening statements. Candidates, you'll each get two minutes. We randomly drew the order before tonight's debate. We will start with Thomas Elwood. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Elwood, and it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be here with you this evening as we discuss the future of the city of Jonesboro, which we're all greatly concerned with. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Jonesboro. I, attend, I graduated from Jonesboro High School in 1978, and I graduated from Arkansas State University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. History is very important to me. And I'm really no stranger to this mayoral race. Uh, I ran in 2016 because I thought I had some practical ideals that I could offer. And I'm pretty pleased with some of the impacts, some of the ideals I talked about then have actually became reality. Uh, there's drainage ditches got cleaned out, so we didn't need a stormwater utility tax. Uh, the police payroll thing got uh, settled. And there's actually sidewalks in North Jonesboro, which I never thought would happen. And I, nobody's ever asked me to run for public office, and I'm not doing it out of ambition or ego. I'm just doing it because I actually do have some practical ideals that I'd like to share and improve the city of Jonesboro, especially in green space this time around with trees and some of the things that I'm actually familiar with. And just like in 2016, the only promise that I'll ever make is that uh, if you elect me and make you the next mayor of Jonesboro, that I'll do the very best job that I know how to do. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Shatley. Good evening, Diana, and thank you to KIT and uh, my alma mater, Arkansas State University, for hosting this uh, important debate for the mayor's race. My name is Andy Shatley, and I'm excited to be running for Jones, uh, mayor of Jonesboro, my hometown. Uh, my parents, Curtis and Diana Shatley, moved to Jonesboro in 1983. Uh, they moved here to uh, serve in the music ministry at Walnut Street Baptist Church. And I met my high school sweetheart, Misty, here. And in November, we'll be married for 23 years. We have two lovely daughters, Ava and Skye. Uh, Ava's 15 and Skye's 12, and they both attend Jonesboro Public Schools. Uh, I went to Nettleton High School, graduated uh, twice from Arkansas State University and uh, pursued a career in physical therapy for the last 15 years. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been the director of sports medicine at St. Bernard's. It's the largest sports medicine program in Northeast Arkansas. We oversee approximately 3,000 athletes a year. I'm very excited about running for mayor of Jonesboro because I believe in this town and I believe in its potential. On May the 4th, I was the first candidate to announce and ever since the uh, campaign, it's really not been about who the opponent was and, and it really never has been and, and, it, and it won't. It'll be about the vision of Jonesboro and serving the people of Jonesboro and what our potential could be. Uh, words that I use in my campaign is trust, transparency, and teamwork. Uh, those are words that are not just campaign slogans. They are, they are words that describe me as a person, they describe my uh, career, and they also describe what type of leader I'll be in the future. I'm passionate about making Jonesboro safe. I'm passionate about bringing opportunities to anybody who wants to see success in Jonesboro. I'm passionate about promoting Jonesboro to the world abroad and also improving the quality of life here in Jonesboro. I think Jonesboro deserves a mayor who will roll his sleeves up, cast a vision, 
and won't stop until the work is done. And I think that that candidate is me. Mr. Thank Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Thank you, Diana. My name is Harold Copenhaver, and thank you again for K-8 and K-ASU for this evening. But more importantly, I would like to say thank you to my wife and family at home, whom I love, and thank you for your support. I'm again a candidate running for mayor. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Experience. Experience as a legislator. I served on legislative audit, which was taking care of your tax dollars. I served on revenue and taxation committee, where I voted on over $100 million of tax cuts. I served on 911 task force committee statewide. But more importantly, I worked on and stabilized a balanced budget for the state of Arkansas of $5 billion. Experience as a banker and a business development officer in this community, that has provided me the opportunities to work with small businesses and the largest industry in our, in our community, watching them work daily. Experience as a business owner, I had to make payroll. Real life experience, raising three wonderful children in this community, but more importantly, moving forward as we're all gonna be able to do, now I have three young grandchildren. This didn't happen overnight. This took over three decades to mold and mold my opportunity in this community. This is a big job and it has to be done right. Again, I am asking to be your mayor and I'm opening that role up this evening, not only just because of my experience, but because we can work together and make this a better city for Region 8. Thank you. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Candidates, thank you. Let's begin with our questions. You'll each have one minute and 45 seconds to answer each question. For the sake of time, there's no rebuttal or follow-up. So answer as clearly as possible. If you stray off topic, I'll interrupt and direct you back to the question. And once your time is up, indicated by the timekeeper just off camera, I will stop you and ask you to end your answer. Now, our first question. Before March of this year, words like COVID-19, pandemic, and quarantine were not in most people's vocabulary, but now they are. What would be your approach in dealing with the pandemic as the city's top official if you are elected? Now, let's remember that you have a minute, 45 seconds, and let's start with you, Andy Shatley. Thank you, Diana. Uh, one of the issues that I have brought up in my campaign is that we need a public health commission here locally because there's issues that need to be dealt with locally and responding to a pandemic uh, in the future, this is not gonna be the last pandemic we have. Uh, I will tell you that bringing uh, hospital administrators, bringing uh, legislators and bringing business uh, leaders in, into the same room to help make these decisions locally is, is, is what I believe is the best way forward and also having a data-driven solution and a dashboard locally and working with also the Craighead County uh, emergency and also in Jonesboro. That, that, that's how we need to make good decisions moving forward. Now, I will tell you that there's a lot of different advice out there and I try to do everything I can do personally to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. I think, we, I think we, it all behooves all of us to, uh, to do whatever we can do to, uh, to lessen the spread of COVID-19. So it's very passionate for me to, to start that, to bring those people in the room, uh, to make great decisions, data-driven solutions uh, is what I'm about. And that's what I've done in healthcare in the past. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Thank you, Diana. Obviously, this is a situation that the community has not faced in many, many years. But moving forward, we have learned from that, and that's what's so wonderful about our community. Number one, we always pull together. Number two, what I would be able to do is have the relationships in state government and ask for advice and look forward. The advantage in making relationships over the past decade like I have, I'm able to call other mayors, see what they're doing in their communities. I think this is a combination of safety, this is a combination of lives, and again, we look at NYIT as a leader in our community, 
Um, and they have been very forward with their recommendations. Again, we have to listen to our specialists. Obviously, with our two large hospitals in our community, we've got a lot to draw on, and we've done that every time in time of response. So again, I think it comes together. You have to have a leader who is able to make contacts outside of his normal environment, which would be city of Jonesboro, in order to maintain that, whether it's the governor's office, or it's a continuation of other representatives, or whether it's in fact just people within your community. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Well, that's an excellent question, and like you said, nobody could see this coming, but as a student of history, I mean, we've actually been here before as a society. There was the Spanish flu out, I know it's 1918, a long time ago, but that's when they first started wearing masks and social distancing, and it was very effective then, and it's been very effective now, so. We have to follow what the CDC guidelines are. Uh, we may have to make some adjustments locally because no two situations are entirely the same. I wouldn't be in favor of creating any kind of new special task force or organization like that because in today's, not, in today's there's technology, there's the internet, there's sharing of information. I don't see any need, any reason why we would have to. But when you form a committee, then you gotta bring people in the room and then you can't social distance. I mean, it, to me, it just wouldn't work. But we always need to look to history when we have a problem because there's always uh, like even ice storms or anything else. I mean, we've all been here before. There's actually nothing new under the sun, so thank you. All right, Mr. Elwood, thank you. Now let's move to our second question. As Jonesboro grows, it is becoming more diverse. In the past few years, we've seen a large Black Lives Matter movement. The, full, the first full LGBTQIA festival in downtown Jonesboro and a street renamed for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So as the city grows, what is your plan to make sure members of our communities of color and the LGBT community have a voice in important matters deciding our city's future? Again, you have a minute, 45 seconds Let's begin with Harold Copenhaver. Well, thank you again, Diana. And let me say this, diversity. The more our city government reflects our population, the better our community will be represented. And what I mean by that is, this is a wonderful committee, and a community, I mean. But pulling together in the efforts from Arkansas State University, I look at diversity in many different ways. That's a student population as well. We have to get people involved, and this is the excitement that I'm hearing in the community. Now that there's gonna be new leadership, people from all facets of this community, most of which have not been involved in many situations or been asked to be at the table, now they're willing to be asked. So to be able to be at the table be a partner in this community and move it forward is would take away the diversity situation in our community. Now, is racism present? We all know racism is present in, in our atmosphere, but in Jonesboro, we're a special community. A lot of things sometimes come from outside, but not with inside. We're a good community, and I believe in our leadership of our police force, Chief Elliott, He's done a good job in relationship building, and I look forward to working with him in the future as well. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Well, sure, uh, diversity is actually kind of exciting. I mean, we are a university city, and uh, we have different people that move into Jonesboro every day from all walks of life to, to take some of the jobs and the important positions that are actually here for at Arkansas State and at the various hospitals. So. Yes, diversity is pretty exciting. Uh, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, the, the only sad part about this whole situation is it's an election year, and it seems like these situations go away. I keep going back to we've been here before. There was a gentleman named Rodney King at one time, and that was a terrible, terrible situation. There's all these promises that were going to be made. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and, and we're kind of right back where we are, where we were before. And we'd be naive if we don't think that uh, we have a problem here in Jonesboro. So. We just have to be honest and we, we can't sugarcoat our history and we just have to take these problems head on, I think talking about it and uh, actually doing something about it. You can't pass a resolution and say, man, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and then you look around the room and absolutely nothing's changed. So it's not, it's not a, 
you can't really pass a law to get rid of racism or anything. It has to start from within, and it has to start with individuals treating each other with the golden rule. I mean, that's what we were taught when we were kids, to respect other people. And uh, that's just what we need to do. We need to look, you need to look to your past if you want to move forward. And that's kind of what we need to do here in Charlottesville. All right, Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. Yes, Dinah. The third word of my campaign slogan is teamwork. And that specifically refers to having a culture of inclusiveness and acceptance, and also bringing everybody who is talented to the table. And I'm glad that, that that's brought up because in, in the representation of uh, city government leadership in Jonesboro, one of 23 department heads is a minority. And that's not a representative of our population. That's, a, that's something that our campaign uh, delineated quite early on in the process. And one of the things that has to be done is, is you have to have a culture of inclusiveness. So when you have people that are, are applying for positions, that they have to feel like they have a shot at the job. So I started with my campaign team, and my campaign, campaign team represents the, the, this city, this Jones, the city of Jonesboro. So the minority population in Jonesboro right now is about 20 to 25 percent, but the leadership in Jonesboro is probably less than 10 percent. So we have to make improvements there. In 2018, there was a resolution by city council passed that we wanted to improve diversity inclusion of leadership boards and commissions in Jonesboro. So my question to the local, lo local government is, have we improved in that category? Under my leadership, we absolutely will, will improve in that category. One of the last things is that all voices matter. And so if you, have a ta you are a talented person and you have a, a solution for the problems, then you need to have a seat at the table and you need to be invited to solving the problems of Jonesboro. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Candidates, thank you. Our next question comes from KASU 91.9 FM Public Radio News Director, Jonathan Reeves. Thank you, Diana. My question is, when you look at the city's budget, what areas would you like to see either eliminated or reduced in the budget? And conversely, what new expenditures would you like to see placed in the budget? Jonathan, thank you. Let's start with Thomas Elwood. Well, sure, that's an excellent question. That's kind of a technical question. When you talk about the budget, the city budget, very few people actually have ever seen the budget. You'll see a, a, a budget review. It's either six months to a year late. Now, when they talk about the complexities of the city budget, it's actually broken down in two categories. You have police and fire, which they're professionals, and they're, you don't really need a political person or mayor or something really interfering with that operation. You just have to make sure that they're funded in a manner that's absolute as possible that you can continue. And the other half of the budget is actually, you know, backhoes and bobcats and things that I'm very familiar with. So when you're talking about the budget, we can all sit there and make promises, but like this pandemic has uh, changed our budget situation. They say we're not as bad as we could have been or would have been, but uh, you really don't know. And from year to year, you don't exactly know how the budget's going to work out. So you just have to do baseline budgets and uh, try to do the best of what you already have. I mean, everybody likes to have big projects and, and things like that, but uh, you kind of need to do things in an orderly step-by-step -step way and kind of stay within, uh, within your means when you try to do something. So. All right, Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. Yes, uh, some of the things that we, already, we need to focus on, and number one in my campaign has been public service. Well, staffing of the police department and the fire department uh, is an issue, it's a priority that we all need to be concerned about. Uh, our fire department is running uh, trucks right now with only two people on them. They would love to have three and potentially four. They don't have the funds for that right now. Our police department stretch all the way across 82 square miles. We have 165 officers and the chief would love to have more to cover more, more of our areas in town. Uh, things that need to be cut. I will tell you that on November 4th, our campaign will announce a transition team and we will go through every item, line item by line item, to see where issues that we, or, or positions that are no longer necessary, things that are not working anymore, or things that are not effective anymore, those will be cut and then we'll move on to things that are important to the citizens of Jonesboro. But primarily, things that need to be added to or expanded need to be in the public, public safety sector right now. All right, Mr. Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Well, thank you very much again, Diana. And you know, this is, this is a relative point. A balanced budget is key for our community. We have gone the last three years in a deficit. There are some things that can make that up. 
The other thing is that we have to keep in mind that we're not only working with the city budget, but we're also partnering with our county. This is important as we continue to transition into new leadership and having teamwork. Safety. Safety is going to be the number one issue that I'm looking at in budgeting. Everybody that I'm talking to is saying, safety, make my community safe. We need to fund at least four more police officers. We need to fully staff the police officers so they're enabling us to provide us safety, whether they're on the bicycle police cops, they can't do that unless they're fully staffed. We need additional firemen, three additional firemen. Right now, we're running two firemen on three trucks. We need three firemen on three trucks. These are things that in order to make our community safe, then we're able then to add to the quality of life. This is what I'm hearing from the people, but I'm also looking in the budget. It's 131 pages. I again looked at it last night. There are many areas that we can make transformation on, but my key important role is to take care of all the em employees, making sure that they continue to have health insurance and a retirement plan. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. We are going to move on to another question. You will have one minute to respond to this. We call these lightning round questions. And so here's the question. With a new mayor comes a new era in Jonesboro. Should Jonesboro go fully wet or completely dry and why? So we will start this lightning round with Thomas Elwood. You will have one minute to answer. Sure, that's a, that's a question that's on a lot of people's mind. Uh, actually, I think we ought to just keep things the way it is. Uh, whenever you're trying to make changes, there kind of needs to be a reason you make a change. Uh, there's no perfect answer to this. Uh, I know there's a lot of my friends that, that enjoy to go out on the evening and have a glass of wine. Or, and I myself like a, a good cold beer, so there's no secret there. So, Actually, there's a lot of people that was upset when they legalized uh, selling alcohol at a theater, and I totally understand that, and I would have voted against that because when you're watching a movie, you're watching a movie. So that's just some of my thoughts on it. Mr. Elwood, thank you. Uh, Andy Shatley. Yes, the, the, whether or not that Jonesboro or the county should go wet or dry is absolutely a decision for the voters. That is not a decision for the mayor. I will tell you, I will make a promise right here that if there is a liquor license that comes across the city council, I will not vote in favor of that if it comes to the mayor's vote. So it, once again, I will re-harp re on the fact that this, that's a decision for the voters, not the mayor of Jonesboro. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Well, living here as long as I have, I've seen the transformation of our community. I like it the way it is. You know, there was industry to try to bring in into our bigger locations, our store, our fast food. That is not, that's not what this community is about. What I'm hearing in the community is we want entertainment. That doesn't include alcohol. We want entertainment for our young people and for uh, uh, senior adults as well. This is what we need to strive. That's what I as mayor will strive on. The alcohol issue, again, will be handled by somebody else, and that's you, the voter. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Up next, we'll talk more about funding, the city's future, and questions from you at home. You're watching the Jonesboro mayoral debate live from the studios of Arkansas State University School of Media and Journalism.
Welcome back. We are live on the campus of Arkansas State University talking with the candidates for the next mayor of Jonesboro. We've already talked about COVID, diversity, and the budget, but now let's see what many of you are asking about at home. Amanda Hansen is live at the Region 8 News Digital Desk. Amanda. Hey, Diana, I've been monitoring those comments coming in through Facebook and Twitter. I have this one coming in from Marilyn Sawyer. She says Jonesboro needs and has needed for years a permanent housing facility to address the immediate needs of those affected by situations causing them to become homeless. How will you address this issue within your first year as mayor? Thank you. Again, we have a minute, 45 seconds to answer this question. And let's start with Thomas Elwood. Uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, this is one of the things I got into this race to start with, and I talked about it in 2016. We didn't even have the hub then. And I was talking about the homeless and the mental health issues we have. And to Mayor Parent's credit, he said within 90 days he'd have something put together with some of the local ministers, and he did. And the hub is an excellent start, but that's all it is is a start because you cannot do economic development. You go downtown, you park your car, you're going to take your wife and your family out for a nice meal, and there's somebody sleeping right there on the, on the street beside you. I mean, it's an economic issue, too. It's a social issue, and it's an economic issue, and we have to do better, and I do have some ideals on how to do that. The main thing is somebody that's you're either short-term homeless or you're long-term homeless. And short-term homeless can happen to a lot of people, and there's absolutely nothing, no government funding for it. Long-term homelessness, there's, there's solutions for that. But what a homeless person actually needs is a locker. Years ago when they had bus stations in every town, there's little lockers there where you could rent for maybe like $2 a month. But you could put your, your winter coat in there. It, it kind of depends on what time. They, I had a homeless man explain the whole thing to me about how you become homeless, and it was a very eye-opening because it could happen to anybody. With rents sky high in town, like $1,400, if you have a breakup in your relationship and if you do have an alcohol or substance abuse problem, it gets accelerated. The next thing you know, you can't pay your rent and you're living in your car. So it is a problem that can affect families and people and economic development, and we just have to do better, and it has to become a priority. Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. Yes, homelessness is an unfortunate issue. However, the benevolent community of Jonesboro can solve this problem as we work together. The hub now being rolled underneath the Crowley's Ridge Development Council, led by Executive Director Tony Thomas, has, it was a great move by Harold Perrin to move them underneath there to create stability, financial stability, and also structural stability for that organization. They do outstanding work right now, and a lot of people don't understand all the work that they do for people in the chronic homelessness in this area. Chronic homelessness is solved by giving people resources they need all and, and following through in that process of returning them back to successful citizenry. So the Veterans Village is under construction, as many people know. There is going to be an outreach center in the center of that for homeless veterans. Now, in the next year, we need to identify either a, an existing building or a piece of land that works as far as a location that is within our transit, transit system, within the access to groceries, to the necessities that individuals need. But we can do this. This is a problem that we can solve, and we could solve this in the next year because we have the resources, we have the people, and the people's hearts here in Jonesboro, we can do this. We can solve this together. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Yes, this is an issue. And let me tell you, it's expanded not only just the homeless adults, but we have homeless students in high school. This is an area that most people aren't even aware of. But more importantly, we already have the city working on this issue with contractors and builders. We're looking for areas that uh, can home a facility and a building that will make okay. it apparent okay. for That's good to the know. Yeah. child. Uh, sorry, I'm hearing other stuff. Um, but one thing in, in importance is a veterans village. That's very important to me. Uh, I visited with our lady at uh, the city of Jonesboro and who does the grants. She talked about uh, the homeless situation with the veterans. My staff and I reached out to the attorney general office and the attorney general herself. 
and I'm proud to say that she'll be making an announcement following up hopefully within the next week on continuing funding for the Veterans Village. That's what it takes in a mayor is being able to reach out and know whom you need to talk with in order to create the opportunities for the advantages and the disadvantaged people in this community. Thank you. We apologize for that audio difficulty there. Let's turn again to KASU Radio News Director Jonathan Reeves for our next question. Jonathan. With Jonesboro continuing to grow, there will likely be a need to add more fire stations in the future and also to have more police and fire across the city to be able to keep everyone safe. When it comes to public services with a limited budget, how do you plan to fund these needs in the future? Jonathan, thank you for that question. Let's lead off with Andy Shatley. Well, we have already qualified for several grants that pay for additional officers, in the, the police department, and also additional firefighters in the fire department. So we need to stay on top of those safer grants that add two to three, uh, about every three or four years, those roll off and, and we have to slowly assume the expenses for that, but it certainly gets us in a position to, to add those uh, additional needs. Uh, let's talk about the fire station needs uh, moving forward. Station eight and station nine are gonna need to be built in the next four years. Station eight will most likely be in the northeast corridor up around Sage Meadow that that area is booming lots of uh, d a development there and before we have the next audit we're going to have to identify land i would like to see us identify land for the fire station and also an adjacent park there so we can kill two birds with one stone that would be a great addition to that area because it's it's underserved there is not a park in northeast jonesboro station nine is going to have to be built in southwest jonesboro there are approximately 600 to 800 units that will potentially be built in the future in the southwest corridor of Jonesboro. So we're going to have to have Station 9 there also. So we certainly do have needs. But as we continue to grow, uh, sales tax revenue continues to grow from 4 to 5% over the last two or three years. And so I think that we'll have enough money in the budget to do all of those things. All right, Mr. Shatley, thank you. Harold Copenhaver. Well, thank you again, Diane. And, and this is a key issue in moving this community forward. It's safety. Without safety, we're not going to be able to have that quality life. It's important that your children are safe. It's important that you're safe. It's important that the ladies and females of our community are able to walk without being worried. These are advances that we're going to have to take as a community, but the individuals and community members that I'm talking to are ready to take that step. When it comes to the fire department, Yes, they're on a five-year plan. Due to COVID, that plan was delayed by one year. They're still in the process. We're going to be hiring, um, I believe, five to seven, maybe nine new uh, firemen over the period of time uh, and opening two new stations. With my background in insurance, it is key that we continue our ISO rating because that keeps the cost of our insurance. It keeps the ability for our buildings to be uh, built at a higher quality of standard. Uh, when it comes to the fire department, I did work with Mayor Harold Perrin six years ago, and we came together and found money and grant money to have sensors put on top of the stoplights in our community. There's 85 stoplights, 22 of those have sensors, which means the fire department can access you quicker time saving your life. We need to expand that for our community. We need to do it for the police officers, and we also need to make that available for our ambulance services. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Well, again, that's another excellent question. We're talking about funding, and uh, that's always going to be a challenge, and everybody can get up here and say we need this and we need that, but the, exactly how you're actually going to accomplish it is going to be very difficult to do because you know, without public safety, without the police department, uh, you can't do economic growth and you can't hardly do anything. Uh, about the only way, the only promise you can actually make to the citizens is that if we can continue with our economic growth, then we can grow revenue that way. And that's absolutely the best way we can do it. So we have to make good decisions whenever we do anything. Uh, there's always been budget concerns like the mayor's car, you know, he got a big SUV that's 
pretty expensive, and it's it's kind of a sore spot for a lot of the citizens, and rightfully so. I mean, uh, but we have to manage the budget that we have and use the money that we have responsibly. And uh, of course, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I have all the answers, and that uh, and if somebody else has an answer how you can do things without money, I don't really know how you do that. So. Uh, Yes, we just have to go through the budget uh, every year. You can't really go by the budget uh, five-year plans and five-year budgets. Uh, you run into difficulty all the time because uh, things change, like the pandemic. Uh, your revenue strain changes, but Jonesboro's not unique to that. Every city in America faces the same problems. And we've been here before. I mean, let's just be honest about uh, financial matters. So, yes, uh, practical ideals and practical solutions uh, they actually go a long way, so we just need to do better with what we have. Mr. Elwood, thank you. We move on to our next question tonight. Quality of life has been a major topic in recent years. It even prompted a special election aimed at passing a sales tax for quality of life projects. It ultimately failed. Outside of police and fire protection and the needs there, what do you see as the biggest quality of life issue the city faces and how do you plan to tackle and fund it? We start with you, Harold Copenhaver. I'm excited to answer that question because within 36 hours of announcing that I was going to run for mayor, I was meeting with different individuals in this community. They called me said, hey, I would like to visit with you and tell you why I didn't believe in this or why I did. You know what I'm finding out is? All people are wanting to participate. Some people don't want to move the needle as fast as they felt it needed to be. The part of me that is important is that I'm a bridge builder and I can bring the community together in moving this forward. Listen, public safety is on everybody's mind. That is going to be the key focus. In other people's eyes, public safety might mean a safe sidewalk. Public safety might mean a bike trail. Public safety might be a walking trail. But let me tell you what I'm hearing from our community contractors, and I've visited with a lot of them. You know what? They're willing to come together and say, look, we're building a development, but we're willing to put in a bike trail, a walking trail, a green space, guess what? We start putting the pieces, pieces of the puzzle together. Now, all of a sudden, we're not having to create revenue from our general budget for that because the community is pulling together. I'm looking forward in leading this venture and this conversation and bringing people to the table that haven't been brought before. I'm telling you, Diana, this is an exciting time and people are looking forward to it. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Okay, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, at first on Team Jonesboro, when it first came along, I was like a lot of people. I was very uh, skeptical about the whole process, but I did go to every uh, public meeting and listen to a lot of it, and there's, the energy there was just tremendous. I mean, it was infectious. Uh, I wrote a letter to the editor. I'd have to find a copy of it. So, some of the reasons why I supported Team Jonesboro, and the public safety was the, the key to me. Now, it only lost by 100 votes, and if, if the proposal would have been separated in two halves, uh, the half-cent sales tax would have passed for public safety. Now, there's a Amendment 1 that faces the voters right now. I know we're talking about uh, sales tax for roads. Well, it was promised to the people to be a 10-year program to do four-lane roads in Arkansas, which at the time we needed it desperately, and I supported that. But I no longer support it now. I mean, they promised 10 years, uh, the program's over. We cannot put something like that in the state constitution. Now, if the voters reject that one half cent sales tax, then maybe you can approach the voters with a, a more limited uh, project like Team Jonesboro, and maybe we can do some headway there. I'm not sure what's actually doable, but to me, there's a lot of reasonable people out there. People hate to pay taxes, and they don't want to pay any more, but when you see corruptions like Kate Holiday and things like that, it just, and when you don't keep your promise, when they promise 10 years for a program, and the next thing you know, oh, we're going to put it in the uh, Constitution is going to be there forever. So we have to build the trust if we're ever going to get any kind of revenue increase. So those are my thoughts on the issue. And I'm not so sure that we couldn't pass something like that if we come together and be honest and sincere about what we're talking about. Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. Yes, quality of life is important to me. Uh, it's something I'm very passionate about, and I've uh, uh, advocated for active transportation 
and connectivity for years. Uh, it, it's also important uh, to uh, our youngsters' uh, quality of life. It means something different to our youngsters. Uh, I, I had a little, uh, little boy, he's a baseball player. Uh, his name's Yexler, and he came to one of our uh, parties, and he gave me a little of a wristband here. He says, it says, one as one. And what he asked me, he said, Andy, he said, Mr. Shatley, actually, he said, he said, can you make it to where we can have more baseball tournaments in Jonesboro? And I kind of squatted down because he's not as tall as I am. And I said, yes, sir. I said, because that's exactly what we need. We, the, that's quality of life to him. It's being able to play baseball in big tournaments in, in his town. And also, that's an economic driver for our town. So sports tournaments on every weekend running through our town to help us pay for the quality of life projects that we Many of us know that we need and want in Jonesboro, but we have to think outside the box on how to pay for those and, in, and inviting and making Jonesboro an attractive town so we have all kinds of entertainment and sporting events going on in Jonesboro, brings visitors to Jonesboro, helps us pay for all these things that we need. So an active transportation system, and, I, and I, once again, I'm very passionate about that because in 2018, I served on the city's master plan for uh, connectivity for pedestrians and bicycles. So it's very important to me to see all these other developments that are happen, happening throughout town and they're using that, uh, that structure of connecting things with, with the pedestrian in mind and also the bicyclist in mind. And I'm very excited to see that moving forward. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Our next question involves Arkansas State University where we are tonight. Tonight's debate is being broadcast from the main campus and A-State is one of the major employers in Jonesboro. How do you see the university's role? We begin tonight with Harold Copenhaver. I love this question. Number one, I was blessed and our family was blessed in 2009 to be Red Wolf Family of the Year. This was very meaningful to us because we have always participated and worked with Arkansas State University. But more importantly, I learned from Dr. Welch in Little Rock the needs of what it does for our community. This is our number one asset. And we and I, as mayor, will be partnering with Arkansas State University. We're going to do an internship program fully with diversification of the students in all of our departments. I will have a liaison either from the city or from Arkansas State University in contact with the university daily to continue with updates moving forward. This university is the key to our technology future. This university is the key with new ideas and the more, the more that we incorporate these bright young students. Now keep in mind, high school students I plan on involving as well because not everybody wants to go to a four-year entity. But again, involving these students in our community, involving them in projects, I'm excited about this because this is going to happen. We have entities and businesses in our community that have never been involved before, and they're saying, hey, we want to help. We have students in technology and engineering, and we want to partner with the city now and produce more students so they stay in our community. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Well, sure, that's a great question, and it affects all of our families. Uh, in 1967, it was Arkansas State College. It became Arkansas State University, and it was a big deal when it happened. Uh, when my dad got out of Korea, he was a frontline combat veteran, and. Uh, He's originally from Iowa. I'm originally from Jonesboro. I was born here in 1960, but my parents are from Iowa. And my dad, he did a lot of traveling and seeing the world and stuff. And the reason I'm in Jonesboro and was born here is because my mother wanted to come to Jonesboro because of Arkansas State University. Of course, my dad wanted to live in Blyville, but my life would have been much different if that would have happened. But uh, mom wanted to be here just because the university was here to give her kids a chance and opportunity to go to school. And my sister was the first uh, college graduate in our family. She actually has two degrees here from ASU. Uh, I've got a degree in Bachelor of Arts in History, and I have a brother that has a, uh, a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. So ASU is very important to this community. We're lucky to have it, and it's grown so much. Now, I'm in the tree service business with my family, and I'm kind of blessed that uh, if you own a tree, then uh, you're kind of doing pretty well in your life. 
So I get to meet some of the tremendous people, and a lot of them are the college professors here in ASU. They've been some of my customers, and they're kind of a big influence on our business, too. So you can never underestimate the value that uh, Arkansas State University places in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And, and we're all tremendously proud of it. I mean, you can ask uh, Andy or Harold. They'll tell you the same thing. So. Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. I'm a proud graduate of Arkansas State University. I graduated in 2002 with my bachelor's in biology. I graduated in 2004 with my master's in physical therapy. I played three years of football here at Arkansas State. I was an Indian at the time, and they've transitioned to the Red Wolves. I will tell you that Jonesboro would not be the city it is without Arkansas State University. So it's, it's vital that the city of Jonesboro have a symbiotic relationship with Arkansas State University to capture, to recruit, and retain students to the university and help them in their recruitment process and also to retain those students once they graduate. We want those young bright minds in Jonesboro, Arkansas. We want them working here. We want them inventing things. We want them starting businesses in Jonesboro. Two things. I want to involve the Student Government Association with the city administration on a regular basis. That will be done in my administration. The second thing, bringing back and an innovation hub downtown. We had the garage that was sponsored by Arkansas State University, but I want to see us put an innovation hub downtown, and I want to have a coalition of industry to be able to fund that innovation hub, and I want to bring all of these students that want to invent and create and make things, I want to put them in there and just let them fly. We have to support and recruit that generation so that stabilizes the future for Jonesboro. Mr. Shatley, thank you. We are moving on to a lightning round, just like we had before, and your answers will be uh, wrapped up in one minute. So here is the question. Will you support a sales tax increase if it were to be pitched yes or no, and why? We begin with Thomas Elwood. Well, sure, I've already addressed that earlier. My feelings on this haven't really changed. The only way we can do that is if Amendment 1 gets defeated. So, yes, I would support it, and I think the public would support it too, but it, it needs to be well thought out and it needs to be well defined. Uh, we passed a sell, one cent sales tax uh, years ago for in capital improvements in Jonesboro, and it went very well for the first seven years. And after that, the money kind of got in, back in the general budget, and people are afraid of that now. Uh, a special sales tax is how we got Joe Matt Campbell in the first place, which is a excellent facility and it. Jonesboro wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for uh, like Joe Matt Campbell so I have supported uh, sales tax in the past and so have a lot of other people and that's why they pass but you they had to build the trust I mean that's that's key to everything so yes I, I would not I would not shy away from it you know I don't like taxes anymore than anybody else but if amendment one passes I would not support a half cent sales tax for Jonesboro Mr. Elwood, thank you. Andy Shatley. With our sales tax revenues trending at 3 to 5% year over year last year, this is a, is a completely different economic landscape and forecast that we saw last year in 2019. I will tell you this, moving forward, if there are projects that are identified, rendered, finished, that we can touch and see and feel, and also the operating maintenance expenses that are laid out for the voters, then I will support project by project sales tax for those, but a large reaching project sales tax i will not support because of people that i've talked to on both sides of the sales tax initiative and my greatest strength is to be able to listen to people and bring and find a common solution and i think that's what i heard mr shatley thank you harold copenhaver well that's what i addressed earlier in our conversation was again visiting with people are they ready to move this community forward absolutely they are number one they're ready to move this community forward in safety and this is uncertain times in the next three to six months so any initial adjustments could be costly to this community but more importantly i'm going to be creating and already started creating an economic summit this is going to be community leaders business leaders from around this needs to come from an idea of our community not the mayor this needs to also be enforced by our city council as we move forward but again we are a community that is pulling together and we will be driving forward we will have the quality of life but again we have to address our public safety first mr copenhaver thank you and those are our questions tonight but before we go each candidate will get one minute for a closing statement and we will go in reverse order from the opening statements and that means we begin with harold copenhaver 
Thank you again for Diana and K-8 and KASU. Thank you again for this opportunity. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mayor Harold Perrin. Let us all say prayers for him as he goes in his next venture in life. Very proud of the man and what he has done for our community the last 12 years and served on city council. I'm proud and honored that he has endorsed me in this campaign. I'm also proud and very honored and humbled by the firefighters of this community as I've also received that endorsement. It is key that we see that we've heard a lot of good ideas this evening, a lot of numbers, but your question needs to be answered is who is the candidate that has the qualifications and experience to put all this in effect? I feel that I am that candidate. I'm looking forward to being the servant of this community and I love this community. Let's move it forward together. And I'm here tonight to ask you for your vote in November. Mr. Copenhaver, thank you. Andy Shatley. Once again, thank you, Diana, and thank you to KIT, KSU, and Arkansas State University for hosting this very important debate. One of the questions that continue, we, we hear more and more that I've talked to people all over town, and they say, Andy, we absolutely love you, and we see you as being a leader in town, but we wonder if you have the experience to be the next mayor of Jonesboro. Well, I'll tell you this, every person that I've had a chance to sit down and talk to, when they've actually heard what I've done to prepare for this position, they leave with their jaw dropping going, I had no idea you were that prepared. If you wanna talk about experience being a leader, if you wanna talk about experience uh, inspiring people and serving people over the last 15 years, that's the candidate that you're referring to right here. That's the experience that I've had in the past, stable, stability, I've been a physical therapist and director of sports management for the last 12 years. When I move on to something and I take over, that's exactly what you're going to get, and that's the exact candidate you'll get if you elect me as the next mayor of Jonesboro. Mr. Shatley, thank you. Thomas Elwood. Well, sure. Like I said, uh, we've been here before. Uh, in 2016, I ran for mayor, and I haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, I don't really want to seek anybody's endorsement. When you get an endorsement, there's strings attached with it. I mean, that's just part of the political game that uh, – I'm obviously not willing to play. Uh, now, it's not the job of the mayor to uh, reinvent the wheel, reinvent government. It's just to make sure that the wheel spins properly. And I think what everybody out there is looking for, they're looking for fairness and they're looking for honesty and sincerity. And we need a mayor that can actually answer a question in a language that the people can actually understand. And it may be a fault of mine, I don't know, but if you answer, ask me a question, I will give you the best answer that I know how to give. And the only promise, and I'll stay by this, that if you elect me and make you the next mayor of Jonesboro, that I'll do the best job that I can. My life experiences are very unique. Uh, I have a lot of you know, the green industry, so I can change a lot of that kind of overnight. So thank you very much for this time, and it's been enjoyable. And I really like Andy Shatley, and I really like Harold Copenhagen. We've we talked off camera quite a bit, so it's, it's been enjoyable for all of us. So there's no animosity up here between us, and we all kind of agree, so thank you. Sure, I would thank you again. Reintroducing our candidates that have been a part of our forum tonight, Harold Copenhaver, Andy Shatley, and Thomas Elwood. Candidates, thank you so much for your time this evening. We will post this entire debate online at KAIT8.com, the Region 8 News app, and across the numerous streaming platforms, Roku, Amazon, Fire, and Apple TV. Tonight's debate will be updated there later tonight. So if you missed a part of it, you can go back. And, and leading up to Election Day, Amanda Hansen will host one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of tonight's candidates. That conversation will include questions from you, follow-ups, and in-depth discussions as we discuss the city's future. More information on that to come, but for now, Live from the studios of Arkansas State University School of Media and Journalism, I'm Diana Davis. Have a good evening.